Real estate investing is built and powered by partnerships and how you structure those partnerships will have a tremendous impact on your portfolio, your returns, your bank account, and your sanity. And in this video, I'm going to walk you through everything you have to consider when entering and structuring a partnership. So make sure you hit the subscribe button right now so you don't miss more videos about building wealth through multifamily real estate. I'm Seth Ferguson. Let's get right into it and talk about real estate partnerships. And this topic is one that is very near and dear to my heart. I made a huge, huge mistake when I first uh, first started investing in real estate uh, with the partner I chose, and it absolutely destroyed me. And it caused a tremendous amount of grief and hassle, and I want nobody else to have to go through that experience that I did. Uh, it was a total nightmare. So hopefully, my, my hope with this video is uh, being able to help you out and uh, have you avoid uh, that terrible situation. So when we talk about partnerships, what actually is a partnership made of? Like, why would you partner with somebody? Well, to answer that question, uh, let's talk about the real estate matrix. Uh, well, at least I call it the real estate matrix. So there are four components to every single real estate deal. If one of these four components does not exist, the real estate deal does not happen. And every single real estate deal in history has had these four components. And they are, you have the deal itself, you have the equity, or the capital, uh, however you want to say it, we'll just put the dollar sign. You have management, and then you have financing. And as I said before, if a deal doesn't have one of these four things, the deal doesn't happen. This is what every single real estate investment is built on. So how does this uh, kind of equate to partnerships? Well, because every single deal needs each four of these components, what if you don't have those yourself? For instance, let's say you find the deal on the side. Here, let's do it right here. Let's say you have the deal and you can manage the deal. You have the market experience and the knowledge, but you can't get the financing for some reason. So we'll put financing over here. And then uh, maybe you don't have all the equity needed. So uh, maybe you have some of the equity, but then you need some more capital. Uh, so you need capital here. So if person number one, can sign and uh, get the financing and uh, has the capital and person number two has the deal and the management, well, it makes sense for them to partner together because on their own, they can't do a deal. It's, it's almost like trying to bake a cake with only half the ingredients. It's not gonna work out and plus I'll be really hungry. But uh, as soon as they start working together, now they can actually take down a deal and profit from it. So it's a mutually beneficial arrangement. Now, when we talk about partnerships, a lot of people have the impression that, oh, a partnership's just two people. Well, that's not the case. You can have a four person partnership, a five person, a three person. So a, an example here would be, let's say one person has the deal and then one person has uh, the capital and then another person I uh, can uh, get the financing and then they'll also manage it in this case you have number one here deal number two the capital and number three the financing and management now how you structure the partnership uh, will vary based on the situation and, and what the deal needs so in this uh, in the first example we had where we had person number one person number two it's very common to have a 50 50 split but if you have three people involved you could go 33 percent uh to each or you could do one person takes a uh, takes half and the other people divide into quarters. It's however you want to structure. But the key thing is why you need a partnership. If you don't have, if you're missing one of these things, you need a partner. So this is why it's so powerful to partner with people in real estate investing because it's very rare, especially as the deals get bigger, that you have all the equity need or if you have all the requirements the lender needs to give you financing. Uh, may maybe you don't have the skill set to manage it or if, it, uh, if the deal needs uh, a heavy lift in terms of construction renovation, bring in a partner that has that so the deal will run smoother. The other people working on the deal, they'll have a better product with you and uh, you'll have a lot more sanity. So partnerships can be incredibly, incredibly powerful. And just always go back to the real estate matrix. If the deal doesn't have one of these four components, 
you don't have a deal. So now we know what a partnership is made of uh, and it's made of the real estate matrix. Now, what are some things to consider? And uh, this is where some people go astray. This is where I uh, learned a very hard, expensive lesson. And I have a couple more gray hairs because of it. So um, I'm going to be, uh, you know, just tell you guys the way it is. So number one, do you like the person? Now, this might seem kind of like trivial, but it's not. And there's some very, very successful uh, real estate investors who are, uh, you know, uh, close to the billion dollar mark and a couple who are, have surpassed the billion dollar mark for assets under management. And this is a rule they apply. Like uh, with my podcast, Purchase of Profits, I, I was able to interview hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of successful real estate investors. And believe it or not, this was actually probably the, one of the most important things that they used uh, when they were uh, looking for a potential partner. Do they get along? Do they share the same values? You know, do they communicate well the, the same way? All that sort of stuff. It's incredibly important because this is what will happen. Over the course of a real estate deal, maybe you'll have year one and then it goes to year five. It's not always smooth sailing. <laughs> you know, you might hit choppy waters in year two and year three, and then it'll smooth out for year four and five. If you're already strained when you start with that partner, uh, imagine uh, how it's going to be when things get choppy. So you have to have that solid foundation of respect, and you also have to have that uh, the likability factor and uh, be able to communicate with each other. So do you like the person? Do you get along? If so, well, yeah, then move on to the next step. So when you're st actually structuring your partnership, a big thing to consider is control. Who is making all the decisions? Now, depending on how you choose to uh, work things out, let's say you're syndicating the deal, uh, you could have different classes of shares within the general partnership, different you know voting rights and all, all that sort of stuff uh, to help you gain control. Also in your uh, joint venture, let's say you're doing a joint venture with somebody, uh, like a partnership, uh, you can also structure the agreement, but who is making the decisions? Who has control? And this is where a lot of partnerships uh, get into some trouble because at some point you start off with the same goal and then after three years you might be on different paths you might have different ideas about where that uh, property should go the strategy you should employ maybe something's happening in the market and one person wants their money out and or you want to do something else with it you know whatever it is but who has control is it 50 50 do you guys both have to agree or is one person basically uh, wearing the pants and, and uh, running the entire project this is a huge Huge thing so don't kind of gloss things over so when you are doing your partnership agreement and you're hashing things out don't push things to later or be like oh we'll figure it out when the time comes do the heavy lifting up front I say this all the time about uh, real estate uh, you know underwriting and everything you want your surprises up front so put it in writing and have those battles down when everybody's in a good mood because if something's wrong or somebody's under pressure that is a wrong time to figure out a good solution uh, and then that's when uh, you know some partners might uh, decide to take some actions that are very not beneficial, let's put it that way. So uh, figure out control, figure out the process on how you're going to arrive at decisions, figure out a mediation, or if you do have a disagreement, how will you solve that disagreement? Put it into place. Will you bring in an arbitrator? Will you go to mediation, try and figure it out? Do you have a trusted advisor that you both look up to that you will both agree to go to with the issue and hash it out? And will it be binding or non-binding? All these things you have to figure out in advance. Another important thing to consider, especially with real estate investments, and this will go into all your investing paperwork, but uh, cash calls. This uh, causes a lot of uh, consternation as well. So with a cash call, if you're not familiar with what a cash call is, is let's say you have a real estate deal and then all of a sudden uh, you, you need a capital injection. You need money put into the deal for whatever reason. Maybe it's an unexpected repair. There's a whole bunch of different things that can happen, but the property needs cash. It needs the cash infusion. Well, who's going to come up with this cash? Is it, uh, if you're in a partnership, uh, you know, is it uh, all the partners? Uh, are you allowed to bring in another partner uh, with the cash? And if so, uh, how are how is everybody else's ownership diluted in that case? Uh, because if the person's coming in with the cash, um, they know they're in a better position, so they'll probably play some hardball uh, to get themselves a, a preferred position or a better position than everybody else who was initially in the deal. Figure this stuff out in advance. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to be stressing this because this is a mistake I made when I first started in my younger years investing in real estate, and it caused me a whole lot of grief. So what happens with cash calls? Uh, 
by capital infusions. Who's responsible? Figure this out. If you're syndicating the deal, that's going to be in your PPM or your OM, uh, but a lot of people, they'll start off with joint ventures, uh, joint venture agreements, JV agreements, and a lot of people don't do this. And number four, I'm going to call it shotguns. Now this is uh, this happens in like the one percent of the one percent, but it happened to me. So you always just want to plan for a worst case scenario. And I think overall, like with all of this kind of stuff, you always have to think, well, if this ends up in court, how will my agreement stand up? Uh, it has to be very clear and concise. You have to. There can't be any wishy washy verbiage. The clearer you can make it, the better. And a lot of people, I would say this might be a bonus uh, number five point, but a lot of people will be worried or concerned that, well, you know, if I have hard conversations now. Now, um, you know, it might put off the other person. Well, actually, it'll make your relationship a whole lot stronger because, like, people have to feel heard and understood. And you may have one impression about what your partner is thinking, but then as you're having these discussions, well, maybe you're going to discover that, oh, well, that's not what they think. They actually think about it this way, which is a good thing. You want that to come out before uh, you're in this project and you're three years in already. To have that clear communication, the best way to do that is put it in clear writing, easy to understand words, but make it very, very exact so everybody uh, is clear. Plus. Uh, lots of times, uh, let's say it's four years in the future, you'll have a disagreement. You can actually go back and reference your agreement. And you know, sometimes people forget. So they may be entrenched in one position, but as soon as you review the agreement, it's like, oh, actually, no, I, I did agree to that. Okay, well, well, we'll do it this way then. There are so many benefits to doing this stuff up front. So I don't want to rant too much, but this stuff is very important. So with shotguns, Let's say uh, one partner goes rogue, uh, in my, like in my case. So uh, let's say the partner starts taking um, actions uh, that are detrimental to the uh, portfolio or to the property. How can you eject them from the partnership. So maybe you have three people and one partner goes rogue. Uh, so they stop uh, communicating. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, it's it's been a while that you've never heard from them and you're trying to send them uh, emails, calls, letters, all that stuff, and they just stop responding and things have to happen with the property. What is your process for removing them from the partnership. A lot of people don't like to think about this stuff, but it can happen and it did happen to me. Let, let's say if your documentation says, you know, everybody needs to vote on this matter uh, and you can't get a hold of the person and the property needs attention, but you can't act uh, because they're there. Well, you know, how do you remove them or shotgun them out of the, the partnership? So uh, speak with the lawyer and when you're drafting all this stuff, take the time, speak with a, an experienced lawyer who has the war stories, who can actually like fill you in and give you some color as to the reasons why you need certain clauses in there and uh, what to do when um, and they'll have a ton of stories trust me uh, on uh, that will actually help you see well oh well this clause is very beneficial because I actually had it. this happened to my client and this is how they got uh, you know bulldozed or whatever it is so a shotgun agreement you never would have thought about it, but until it happens to you, like if it does happen to you, you will be very glad that you do have provisions in your partnership agreement to remove a partner. You know, whether it's a buyout, uh, a buyout at a appraised price or however you decide to do it, um, at least it's in there. So I could go on forever and ever and talk about specific clauses, but your lawyer is going to be able to tailor that uh, to your specific situation. But just to recap, whenever you're creating your partnership, always go back to the real estate matrix because you need those four components and each one of those is equally valuable because the deal can't happen. So as long as you have those four, uh, that's going to be a good partnership or the basis of a good partnership. Do you like the person? Can you communicate? Do you get along? Do you share the same values? Who controls the partnership? who's making all the decisions and how will you make those decisions? And if you have a disagreement, how do you solve it? Uh, cash calls, what happens when the deal gets in trouble? Um, you know, can you bring in other people? If so, what's the process for that? How do you vet the new partner? Does everybody have to agree? Do you need two thirds majority, 50%, whatever? And then how do you, how do you remove somebody? This is something I never even thought about and it stung me hard. So. How do you remove uh, somebody who's not performing who, or who is starting to take detrimental actions uh, that could jeopardize your investment? Food for thought, it's not pleasant, but if you do your heavy lifting up front, it will definitely save you a whole lot of stress and a whole lot of money and a whole lot of time. So if you like this video, if you found this useful, hit the like button, leave a comment, let me know what you think. It really helps out the channel. And until next time, happy investing. <laughs>